Welcome back to Battleship Systems. It's time to talk about battleship refrigerators. Feeding nearly 2,000 sailors for a month is no small order. Battleships have refrigerated compartments that can store over 100,000 pounds of food. And you will see that these refrigeration systems are very different from the ones in your house. Please check the errata page in the description. While this video mainly focuses on the refrigerated storage systems of the USS North Carolina, we'll be going over the differences of all the museum battleships refrigerating systems. Let's start with the early 1900s era refrigerating system of the USS Texas. The cold storage rooms are located on third deck near the stern on the port side. The system used a slightly more complicated version of the refrigeration cycle. That's because the battleship Texas was built before Freon was invented. The system actually uses carbon dioxide as a refrigerant. CO2 requires much higher pressures than Freon. If you remember, my home air conditioning operated at 270 PSI. Now a carbon dioxide refrigeration system operates near 1000 PSI. To achieve this, the ship had five massive horizontal dual acting compressors that are built to withstand this high pressure. I won't be going into detail about how the Battleship Texas refrigeration plant works just because of how complicated a CO2 system can be. But just look at how big the ice machinery room is compared to the actual cold storage rooms themselves. To be fair, this system was also responsible for cooling the scuttle butts or drinking fountains and the magazine spaces. CO2 refrigeration systems are still popular for supermarkets and large industrial process cooling. Now let's move on to the refrigerating plant of the USS North Carolina. This system uses the refrigeration cycle to transfer heat out of the cold storage compartments and into the sea. For the refrigerant, it used dichlorodifluoromethane, or R12, also known as Freon-12. This is a 12 ounce can of Freon-12. It would take 333 of these bottles to fill this monster of a system. The Navy chose Carrier Corporation to make the refrigerating plants of the North Carolina class battleships. Carrier was known for their mobilization efforts during the war, earning them the Excellence in Production or Navy E Award five times in a row, an achievement which they were very proud of. The cold storage rooms are located on third deck with two separate compartments for fruits and vegetables kept at 40 degrees Fahrenheit three meat rooms kept at 15 degrees, one for butter and eggs and milk Woo! kept at 32 degrees, a thawing room kept at 40 degrees, and of course, what would a refrigerator be without an ice making set? Look at the relation in size of the refrigerating compartment versus the ice machine room on the USS Texas. Then compare that to the ice machine room size on the North Carolina versus its storage rooms. That's the power of Freon. But the refrigeration plant would just be a bunch of pipes and valves if it weren't for the compressors. These are four cylinder, single acting, belt driven, reciprocating compressors. Mounted above every compressor is a condenser and accumulator duo. After the Freon is compressed into a hot gas, it enters the condenser. The condenser is a seven foot long brass tube filled with smaller tubes that carry water to cool the refrigerant. Seawater is pumped through these condensers by means of a circulating pump and then discharged overboard. After the Freon leaves the condenser, it enters the receiver as a liquid. The receiver is just a reservoir to make sure there is enough Freon available to handle any load. This is the last step before it enters the refrigerating circuit. Since this is a battleship system, there are three semi-redundant compressor-condenser pairs. These units supply the two separate refrigerating circuits. One circuit takes care of the fruit and vegetable rooms, two meat rooms, and the thawing room, while the other circuit handles the last meat room, butter and egg room, the other fruits and vegetables room, and the ice making sets. Both circuits can be supplied from any condenser-compressor pair, but normally it would be operated with number one and number three, leaving number two as a spare. Now let's say condenser number three breaks down. You could then direct the Freon to condenser two while still using compressor three. It's a sealed system, but refrigerant will inevitably leak out, 
either through worn out valves, gaskets, or even shock damage from the ship's guns. The system is designed to allow you to repair individual components while keeping the refrigerating plant up and running. After all, a starving crew can't fight. After you repair something in a refrigeration circuit, you can't just open the valves and hope that everything starts working again. You have to make sure that nothing but Freon is allowed to enter the refrigeration circuit. To do this, you would evacuate all the air with a vacuum pump. Then you would cut in the liquid line dryer when adding the Freon back. The dryer is filled with an activated alumina that removes any moisture as liquid passes through it. If there is any air in the system, it will collect at the top of the condenser. This can be purged by simply cracking the valve at the top of the condenser until you smell Freon. According to the manual, Freon resembles the odor of carbon tetrachloride. Okay, so once the pure Freon leaves the ice machine room, an automatic control system takes over to keep the cold storage rooms at the correct temperature. Mounted outside each compartment are three devices. A strainer, a solenoid valve, and a thermal expansion valve, or TXV. The strainer filters out any dirt particles so as not to clog the TXV. The solenoid valve will automatically open when it receives power from the solenoid valve control switch. This is basically a thermostat with a remote sensing bulb located in the cooled compartment. From here it enters the TXV to lower the pressure and temperature before it enters the evaporators. The evaporators are just one and a quarter inch copper pipe that run along the bulkheads of the refrigerated compartments. In the case of the fruits and vegetables compartment, that's 442 feet of copper. Now you don't want fruits and vegetable coils to be as cold as the ones in the meat compartment. So at the end of the evaporator pipe is a suction pressure regulating valve. This reduces the pressure of refrigerant in the evaporator to prevent it from getting too cold. The meat compartments and the ice sets do not have a regulating valve because you want them to be as cold as possible. The meat compartment pipes might be around negative 5 degrees, which will eventually cause ice to form. The manual recommends a couple ways of defrosting the coils. One is to shut off the supply of refrigerant to the compartment and leave the door open until it defrosts. This presents the obvious problem of thawing out your food. Another way is to steam the frost off with a steam hose. By the way, have you ever had a refrigerator or freezer that was not self-defrosting? If you did, what did you use to get the ice off? Let me know in the comment section below and don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have a frost-free refrigerator, the evaporator sits in the back of the freezer compartment and a fan blows the cold air through it. A heating coil sits on the evaporator that periodically melts the ice off. If you ever wondered why your refrigerator makes a clicking or bumping noise, this is why. You don't want ice in your freezer, but you do want ice in your ice making sets. There are two ice making sets in the ice machine room. They consist of an evaporator coil submersed in a brine. So what is a brine? Brine is water mixed with calcium chloride in order to lower its freezing point. This allows you to keep the water at 15 degrees. Long cans are filled with water, immersed in the brine tanks, and clamped down. Once frozen, these cans can be removed and placed in the thawing tank until the ice is loose enough to be removed from the can. It's important to note that unlike your home refrigerator, the thermostats do not actually start and stop the compressor. Remember that each compartment has a solenoid valve that opens to let the refrigerant into the evaporators. When the last solenoid of the circuit closes, the compressors will continue to run until the pressure is low enough in the line to activate a low pressure cutout switch mounted on the compressor. This stops the compressor until another solenoid valve opens to increase the pressure in the line and deactivate the cutout. The South Dakotas have a similar cold storage space arrangement. The Iowa's ice machine room and half the cold storage rooms are separated by watertight bulkheads, but the overall system remains the same. You know, if you have an older refrigerator, it might use the same refrigerant that the battleships used. The invention of Freon allowed anyone with electricity to have a refrigerator or air conditioner of any size. It was cheap, efficient, non-toxic, non-flammable, and was used extensively up into the 90s. 
Later on, it was thought that Freon-12 could hurt the ozone layer, so the EPA began phasing out its use in refrigeration systems and restricted its production. Have more questions about battleship refrigeration systems? Why not see one for yourself? Battleship North Carolina has its refrigeration spaces open for visitors. In lieu of donations to me, please consider donating to a battleship museum like the Battleship North Carolina. There's a link in the description that'll bring you to the Friends of the Battleship North Carolina website where you can donate to the nonprofit organization. Thanks for watching.